Thank you very much, Superintendent Karat. Thank you for the very kind introduction and for your amazing work here at Peoria Public Schools and, and of course, for hosting us here at Valeska Hinton uh, Early Childhood Education Center. I love being here among kids. This is, everybody ought to start their day like this. And, um, and I wish I could come sit. Uh, yeah, hi, yeah. <laughs> I know, maybe we could switch places and you could. Um, there are uh, a bunch of wonderful people behind me who care deeply about uh, the work that you all are doing uh, for our youngest children in the state and who uh, do this work in one fashion or another every day. Uh, Peoria Mayor Rita Ali, our uh, leader in Springfield, I really do mean leader when I say Jahan Gordon Booth, she's a, a terrific partner and somebody who cares deeply about these young children and I see it every day. Representative Joyce Mason who chairs the Early Childhood Committee in the uh, House of Representatives and she'll be very important for uh, driving forward and succeeding at implementing uh, this plan in the budget. Uh, and our Illinois Education Association President Kathy Griffin, who gets to see all over the entire state of Illinois the great work that's getting done in our public schools. Uh, it is truly a pleasure to be with all of them, with all of you to celebrate progress for Illinois' youngest children. And it's even a greater pleasure to be here to usher in more progress. Uh, by every metric, there is no more important public investment that we can make than in our youngest children and their families. And that's why I'm asking our General Assembly to adopt the Smart Start Illinois plan. It's a multi-year investment that will provide every three and four year old with access to a preschool program like this one. It begins with adding $250 million in programs this year and $100 million in facilities. We're putting more money in the hands of providers to expand their programs, raise quality, and hire more staff. That means that uh, Principal Katie Cobb and School Board President Martha Ross uh, can ensure that staff at Valeska Hinton see the support that they deserve. It means that teachers like Alicia Blake Guyton, who you'll hear from a little later, will have more resources and more time to guide her preschoolers through the day. In the next school year alone, we will add an additional 5,000 preschool spots all across the state of Illinois. Uh, Andre Allen and Jalisha Allen are also here with us today, two incredible leaders in the Peoria community, and doing it all with three young children. Mr. and Mrs. Allen will share their experience finding a preschool program with us in just a moment. Uh, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to hear their story. It's not atypical of the story of many families in search of early childhood programs. The next part of Smart Start Illinois is all about quality child care. To give children the best possible care, we'll launch the nation's first early childhood workforce compensation contract program. Um, that's a lot of words that means we're gonna bring stability to the field by increasing wages for a workforce that is primarily women and people of color so that we can attract and retain many more people into the childcare field. We'll also raise the standard of care to ensure quality early childhood programs. Smart Start will pair higher wages with an early childhood ACE scholarship program, allowing us to expand the pipeline of early childhood uh, educators in Illinois. Already over 1,500 individuals have received scholarships since the program began last academic year. That program will continue on, not just this year, but in the subsequent three years, at least under the plan that I've put forward. Many Illinois families need access to services like home visiting and early intervention. Those are different than childcare and preschool, but extraordinarily important. Um, but providers don't currently have enough capacity. Since the height of the pandemic, early intervention caseloads have skyrocketed, uh, exceeding pre-pandemic levels in a short amount of time, and the industry hasn't been able to keep up. The Smart Start plan is going to change that. I'm proposing a $40 million funding increase for early intervention services, allowing thousands of children and families to maintain access to these 
critical services and giving providers a much needed boost. The same goes for home visits. Home visiting in Illinois is an evidence-based program that has a long history here. In fact, we were one of the earliest states to put in a home visiting program. It was something back in the day people didn't really understand why would you need to go visit people at home, but it's so vitally important. It does a lot of things, but let's just say the results after years here of doing it are improved maternal and child health, uh, prevention of child abuse and neglect, reducing crime and domestic violence, and promoting um, children's development and school readiness. Smart Start's expanded home visiting funding will allow us to reach many more at-risk families. On top of that, if that wasn't enough, uh, I'm proposing that we devote $100 million more to building new child care and preschool facilities and expanding existing ones. Now, expansion doesn't work if you don't have the people to uh, help and work in these facilities, but we're doing that all at the same time. We want to make sure we have facilities available and the educators to work in these facilities. And hearing uh, Dr. Karat talk about 300 people on a waiting list, this is what we call a child, uh, early childhood desert. When you don't have the ability to put your child into an early childhood program, that's a desert. Even if you've got a program, if it's full, the next person in line doesn't get it. It's a desert to them. Uh, too many families can't access early childhood programs at all because, well, there's, there aren't any available spots or uh, 45 minutes away one way is childcare, and 45 minutes the other way is your work. And that just doesn't work for families. So uh, we've got to make sure that we're making the expansion investments that are required. Uh, since I became governor, we've increased eligibility for the state's child care assistance program to 225% of federal poverty level. That's about $67,500 for a family of four. Um, so anywhere at that level or below, this program is, um, is effective for them. And we're trying to raise that 225% to 300% over the next couple of years on a sliding scale so that we can expand this and make it available to so many more families. By doing so, Illinois has become, by doing what we've already done, Illinois has become one of the nation's top 10 states for childcare accessibility. That's good, but it's not good enough. I'm going for number one in the country. So I'm asking the state legislature to increase the child assistance program by another $70 million this year so that we can provide child care to even more working class families. Every study, every study says that the same thing uh, is true about early childhood investments. 90% of brain development occurs zero to five and children who get quality interventions are far more likely to succeed in K through 12 and to go on to college, to graduate from high school, go to college, get a job and earn more during the course of their lifetimes. In fact, the studies have shown and there's a great Nobel Prize winning economist at the University of Chicago named uh, uh, Jim Heckman who studied this, they, you know, at the University of Chicago, and if you're an economist, they have topics like human capital development. That sounds pretty boring. What they mean is, <laughs> is how do we develop uh, people and help them and invest in them? And what he's shown is that for every dollar you invest in early childhood, you save $7 over the course of that child's lifetime. So it means, again, less remedial programs during K-12. It means they're actually healthier. Kids who get early childhood uh, programs are healthier during the course of their lifetimes. And again, graduating from high school, going to college, getting a job, earning more, all of that is beneficial and reduces the cost of uh, 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 social programs for the state of Illinois. Plus, you know, quality childcare and preschool affords parents the opportunity to accept a full-time job or to jump back into completing a degree. For two decades before I became governor, I was focused on improving early childhood development for families in Illinois and across the United States, and it's been my great honor to carry that mission into public office. From home visiting and early intervention to child care for infants and toddlers to preschool for three and four year olds, Smart Start Illinois is a comprehensive plan to build one of the best early childhood systems in the nation. 
It's what our kids deserve. It's what our parents deserve. And we owe it to them to deliver. So I want to thank all of you. And with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce really the best partner you could imagine having in governing the state of Illinois and someone who cares deeply about equity and has put her time, effort, and energy in. And that's our great Lieutenant Governor, Juliana Stratton. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to take any questions from members of the media. Yes, sir. I'll start off first. With, uh, with this investment, uh, regarding educator workforce, they face tough wages, <clears throat> tough working conditions, uh, more tough working conditions, and even just challenges of the job itself. How do you get more people through this investment interested in becoming educators? So let me begin by reminding you what it was like to be a child care provider, a, a worker, child care worker, four years ago. Four years ago, we had a minimum wage in Illinois that was $8.25. A uh, typical child care worker in Illinois was maybe making $9.25, maybe $10. Um, and the opportunity to go get $11 an hour was enough for many families who were living at poverty level uh, to just decide, yeah, I've got to move on. I've got, you know, I need to bring more dollars home. Uh, and so it's been obvious to me for a couple of decades now that child care workers, just picking them for a moment, have been vastly underpaid, too close to minimum wage, uh, and the minimum wage has been too low. And so we've worked over the last four years, you know, as you know, we've been raising the minimum wage by about a dollar a year. Um, we're going to $15, but now, we have to be competitive with other industries, and there's so few people out there looking for jobs as compared to the number of jobs available that wages have gone even higher than $15 an hour. So we're looking to first raise wages for people in childcare to $17 to $19 to begin with, and then beyond that, because we need people who want to stay in the industry, can stay in the industry with the uh, wages that are being provided. So wages are one thing, training is another, and I, you know, we can talk about early childhood educators, those who have a higher education degree, uh, whether it's for an early childhood pre-K program or something else. Um, and those folks are, these are teachers. These are teachers just like the teachers that are in kindergarten, um, just like teachers in fifth grade, just like teachers in high school. Um, they need a degree and they've got to be able to justify getting that degree with the wages that are provided. So lifting up wages across the board is hugely important. And then making sure that we're showing people that there's a path in early childhood for them to do better and better over time. And that's one of the reasons that uh, Senator Christina Passione Zayas, who's not here with us today, came to me a year and a half ago and said, let's take some ARPA dollars and dedicate it to a two-year program to try to upskill people who are in early childhood already, but maybe don't have a higher degree so that we can bring people along, bring the pipeline of teachers along, which we're also doing now in K-12. Um, but this is something very important. We put $200 million aside for those uh, scholarship programs. And then um, what I'm proposing to do in this coming year and for the next three years after that in FY 25, 26, and 27 is to continue that because we need more and more people to raise up in the early childhood field quality teachers, more teachers, better pay. These are all things that make up a better workforce in early childhood so that we can expand and have more kids. Yes. A couple questions. Um, some people are calling him your education oil, uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. He was- Because um, he's not for educating people, is that what? <laughs> uh, I don't know, it's not okay. oil. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to know um, what your thoughts were on his speech last night. And then as a piggyback, do you think the state should increase incentives for local police departments to help recruit more officers? What was that last question? Um, should we send what for? Uh, well, uh, comments on his speech, and should yeah. the state increase incentives for local uh, police departments yeah. to help recruit more officers? Yeah, so, um, so let's see. I'll start with I didn't watch the speech. Um, I read reviews of it or r reports of it. Um, and I can just say that the things that I read anyway are not things that 
They're, they're not the values that most people in Illinois share. Um, you know, what he's done in Florida is to try to have the government intervene to a large degree in the quality of the education or the type of education that people are getting and that will lower it. Um, I think teachers are worthy of investing in and, te and by the way, we shouldn't be banning books uh, from our libraries. Teachers shouldn't be forced to, you know, toss books away or uh, put them in a drawer. Um, and the truth is that we, we actually have a much better education system in Illinois than they have in Florida. We're ranked higher than they are. U.S. News and World Report ranks K-12 education in Illinois sixth in the country and number one among the largest states in the country. So he's got nothing to brag about when it comes to education. So, uh, so he moves on and tries to use this word woke. Uh, to describe everything. He doesn't even know what the word means and he has no definition of it. It's just anything he doesn't like is wokeism. And uh, all I can tell you is that I don't know what that means and frankly uh, what I can say about Illinois is that uh, we're a state that cares about equity, we're a state that cares about our families, we're making the investments that are required so that our youngest children will do better and better. Um, and I'm really excited about the direction of our state as opposed to a state where they don't make the investments that are necessary to lift up their education system or their health care system. Perfect. And um, just the second part of the question, it's not related to education particularly, but uh, should the state increase incentives from our uh, capital to low chief? Um, should the state increase incentives for local police departments? Oh, yeah. to Sorry, you did ask that. Um, uh, I absolutely believe that uh, police officers um, are first line uh, first responders, uh, law enforcement uh, g generally don't get paid enough. Um, just like teachers, uh, honestly, these are the most important people in our society, right, who help us keep uh, uh, you know, our streets safe and who help us educate uh, for the future uh, kids who will do better and better as a result of investments that we'll make, but we've got to make sure we're attracting people into these professions with the proper pay scale and benefits. Um, so I'm absolutely in favor of it, and the state has been engaged in that. I just want to point out that the lieutenant governor runs a uh, program called the R3 program, and it's a dollars that have come from the legalization of cannabis in the state, which are many. Um, have gone into the R3 program at which they are making uh, um, grants to organizations, including ones that support local police. And then add to that that um, many of the things that we've invested in over the last couple of years have been to the benefit of our police departments across the state of Illinois. Uh, so we're going to continue to do what's right for law enforcement. I know there are people who uh, want to make a false argument that there's not a lot of support for law enforcement. I'm not somebody who has said defund police. I'm somebody who says fund police. We need to hire more police. I think we need to make sure that we have great police on the street. People who aren't doing it right shouldn't be in the profession, that's for sure, and they should be held accountable. But people, the vast majority of people who enter law enforcement in the state of Illinois are great people that deserve the support of our communities. How long do you do law yes, sir. From what I understand, the Peoria Police Department has not received the funding that's expected for its co-responder program yet, but other communities have. Do you have any explanation for what the delay is or when that might be expected? I don't. That is news to me, and I certainly will. Okay. Do you want to sure. respond to that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the co-responder model has not gotten, received the funding yet because um, the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority goes through a budget process, and at the last budget process, the Peoria program produced a, uh, a budget document that was not in alignment with the rules that had been written. And so they're going to go back before that budget committee at the next budget hearing, and we hope to be able to have some success and have the money on the ground uh, as soon as possible. Do you have any idea of the timeline of that? Is the budget might take place? I think the, but the next budget meeting should be in the next 30 days. 30? Yep. Thank you, Jennifer. Yep. Well, let's just one more back here.
Lindsay and Sophia Lindsay, his wife, welcome from the first black people here in Peoria. And I want to see if you guys are interested in even trying to recognize these historical figures, considering that it's Black History Month, and that we're also entering Women's History Month as well. Personally, I'll just say I'm always interested in lifting up <laughs> pioneers, really. I mean, particularly, um, you know, black, brown, white, but particularly we're, when we talk about people who have been under-recognized for too many years for, for reasons that, well, we all know. Um, and so I, I don't know those three individuals. I'm glad you raised them. I will learn more, and I absolutely think that we should be recognizing people who have been under-recognized. Great, I appreciate that, and you should probably send them to the representative as well, okay, sure. leader. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.